Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to our latest installment of Office Hours. My name is John Kowalski. I'm part of the marketing team here at Bit Gardner. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the Office Hours format, uh, we are going to have a brief presentation, maybe 20 minutes-ish, um, followed by uh, questions, comments, um, any challenges uh, that you may have. Um, so if you have any questions um, or, or thoughts during the presentation um, or even now, uh, log them in the Q&A box located in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. We'll get to them uh, uh, directly following the presentation. Um, we have several members of our field sales team, our uh, applications team, and our business line uh, team on the phone. Uh, so a lot of experts here to help you. Um, also, we are recording this and we'll make the presentation available uh, to you uh, in the next day or so uh, during our follow-ups. Uh, so with that, let me introduce you to today's speaker, uh, Ms. Ray Roby. She's our business line manager for automotive and all-around color expert. Ray, it's all yours. Good morning, everyone. So we've had a lot of questions about, you know, how to correlate visual versus numeric and, you know, what the differences are. So we just wanted to go through this because we think this is a really important topic for a lot of people in the industry. Okay. So what influences our visual perception? It can be the illumination angle, the viewing angle, the viewing distance, and the lighting conditions. So we'll talk a little bit about all these things. So first of all, it's really important that depending on where you are in the world that you always measure at the same time of day. Um, so a lot of the OEMs specify that you can do color harmony only between 10 and two. But the thing with this is, depending on where you are geographically, that can change. So this maximum solar amplitude can change based on the geographical location or on the season, the summer, winter, fall, whatever. So <clears throat> to explain to you about where you are in the world and what you see, so if we had the same vehicle in four different locations, um, say Munich, um, Cape Town, Shanghai, and Detroit at June 21st, 2016 at 12 p.m. In Munich, my incident of light would be 61 degrees. If I go to Detroit, my angle of incidence is going to be 70 degrees. And if I go to Shanghai, my angle of incidence is going to be 82 degrees. And in Cape Town, my angle of incidence is going to be 32 degrees. So what does this mean? If I'm in Munich and my angle of incidence of light is 61 degrees, I'm actually looking at the 75 degree angle when I'm comparing the data to the Big Bang. If I'm in Shanghai with an angle of incidence of 82 degrees, I would be looking at the 110 degree on the Big Mac. And if I'm in Cape Town, I'm looking at the 45 degree angle. So if I look at the data in Cape Town, I think this car looks great. If I'm in Sh or Munich, I think it's okay. And if I'm in Shanghai, I don't like this vehicle. So this is the same vehicle viewed under different illumination angles, and this is the difference that you'll see. So just be aware that you need to look at all the data when you're comparing it to visual to make sure you're not missing an angle. Also, depending on the time of year, you can have different incidents of light. So if I am in Munich in June, my angle of incidence is 61. If it's September or March 20th, my angle of incidence is 40. And if I'm in December in Munich, my angle of incidence is 18. So the Big Mac measures at a 45 degree illumination angle. And there's only two times at, in Munich where this would match actually the meter itself, what you're viewing. So on March 29th and September 6th, your angle of incidence is 45 degrees. 
and that would match directly correlate to the Big Mac. Otherwise, you have to pay attention to where the angle is. <clears throat> so on June 24th, my angle of incidence is 61. And I would be looking at the 75 and the 110 degree angle. In December, I would be looking at the 45 degree angle. So this is important because a lot of times when um, cars are initially built, they'll be built like say in a June time frame, and then you'll be looking at it and evaluating it later. So you may not be looking at the same angle. So it's really important that you pay attention to what angle you're looking at and to make sure the data corresponds with what you see. And then also to make sure that you're looking at the other angles because you might not be viewing them all at the same time. And then if we were March 29th or September 6th where the incident angle is 45, we would be evaluating the 45 and the 75. So what can happen is you can get a car bought off in June and everyone thinks the color harmony is great and then maybe you go into September and you're not looking at the same angle and now you see a problem with the vehicle, even though the paint hasn't changed itself. The other thing that's important is that you pay attention to the size of the people. We always say you wanna maintain the same distance from the vehicle. Um, the only problem with this is if you have a taller or a shorter person, you could have a difference in their viewing angle. This is not as critical as the other things that I talked about, but it is also critical. So a medium-sized person would be viewing about a 26.6 degree angle. A taller person would be viewing at about a 31 degree angle. And a small, shorter person would be viewing at a 21.8 degree angle. So this just means my angle that I'm viewing at is gonna change depending on how tall I am. So for a short person, and the 26.6 degree, they actually should move closer to the vehicle than a medium-sized person. And then the taller person can actually step back farther and they can see the same angle of incidence or like a lot of times when someone's not agreeing with what I see visually and they're taller than me, I try to stand on my tiptoes to see the same angle that they're viewing or if they're shorter than me, I try to bend down to their angle so I can see the same thing that they're seeing because it's not a huge change, but it can change what you see based off your viewing angle. So we want to achieve harmony on the vehicle, and obviously the main harmony points are the fascia to body, and this gives us a stable process over time. So when we look at these different parts, we wanna keep a few things in mind. So if I look at where the fascia to the body meet, and it's a curved surface, but it's a vertical surface, and I'm looking straight on, so tangential to the vehicle, and the panel's flat, as you can see in the picture. And my son's here. I'm looking at approximately the 75 degree angle when I evaluate it on the flat surface. If I look more at the top of this where it's more curved, I'm looking at around the 25 degree angle. So those are very different. And I know a lot of you guys have probably seen how the body's curved and sometimes everything doesn't line up correctly, but you just need to be aware of what angle you're looking at. And then if I look underneath the curve, I'm actually looking at the 75 or the 110. So it's just important that you're aware of these things. Also on the horizontal surfaces, it's really important to note where the sun is. So if the sun's behind me, I'm looking at approximately the 75 or the 110 angle. And if the sun's in front of me, I'm looking at the 15 or even the minus 15. So this is important because when you're correlating it to your data, you wanna make sure you know what angle to be looking at. So why do we wanna evaluate the colors outside and you know what's the difference in how we add or mount these parts on the vehicle? Well, everybody does things a little bit differently. 
So when we look at a body to rear bumper, these two are pretty much lined up directly to each other. And if the sun's coming from that direction, I'm looking at approximately the 75 degree angle. If I look at this fascia, the body, you can see the picture's a little fuzzy, but you can see that that fascia has a little bit more curvature and it's not directly in line with the body itself. So here I would be looking at approximately the 25 to 45 degree angle. The other thing that's important is if the sun is like directly overhead and I'm standing on one side of the vehicle and someone else is standing on the other side of the vehicle, I could think that it matches very well and they may think that this is a very bad match and the paint needs adjustment. So I would be looking at the 15 degree angle and they would be looking at the 110 angle. So just be aware of always where the sun is and how you're looking at the vehicle. And if you totally disagree with someone else's um, perception of what they're seeing, you want to get to the same exact position that they are and try to look at it from that same angle. So here with the situation I just told you, when I'm looking at the 15, I'm like, okay, this car looks great. And the other person looking at the 110 is like a 2.4 delta and that's going to be a problem for him or her and that's why we're going to see different things. So just in summary, um, what influences what we see? The sun position, obviously the time of day, the geographical location, what season it depends on how much light I'm getting, the influence of the observer, the position, the distance from that person to the vehicle, we should always make sure that this is set the same for everybody. The size of the person, again, just if there's a huge height difference, you guys need to either back up or try to get on the same plane. And then the influence of the different zones. So vertical panels are usually about 45, 75, 110. Horizontal panels could be the 15, the minus 15, and the 110. And then you need to pay attention to how these parts are actually mounted and the orientation that you're looking at them at. And that's pretty much the presentation. So questions? Uh, our first question, uh, thank you, Ray, first off. Um, first question from Dave, is Delta E Audi good for solid colors on the 45 degree angle? You'll have to unmute him. Uh, for some more clarification? Yep. All right. There you are, Dave. Okay, you are unmuted, Dave. Would you mind um, clarifying a bit? Yes, sure. Um, I've got a customer who is painting a solid green and a and they are saying that they want to use the Delta E Audi calculation and I'm telling them that that's probably overkill and they're going to create some problems since the Audi takes into account sparkle and graininess and I just want to get your opinion on that and is am I I'm trying to push them towards Delta E 94 or 2000 at the worst case so this is a bigger discussion but what I can tell you is that the Delta E Audi works for solid colors. Um, and when you change it to be only the 45 degree angle, it actually shuts the sparkle off or it should. And then they shouldn't be measuring sparkle and graininess on a solid color because it doesn't really make any sense. But Agreed. The Audi and the Delta E 2000, that's a little bit more complicated because it depends on what color it is which one's actually going to have tighter tolerances because they roll up differently. So one's a weighted color system output and the other one outputs in Delta L star. So Audi outputs in Delta L star, Delta D2000 outputs in a weighted color tolerance. So those numbers are going to be different. What would you suggest to use for these two solid colors? They only want to read the 45 and metallic on this program 
So what would you try to get them to lean towards? So I think I know who you're talking about and we're actually talking about it right now. <laughs> okay. Is that a good answer? Right. Um, kind of, which, which way so, are you leaning with them? Um, I haven't, like I looked at some colors and when you roll the numbers up, both of them are pretty close. But the tolerancing for the pass fail on a Delta 2000 is anything over one. And for the Audi, you get a little bit more room. So I've got to do some more comparisons to try to figure out which one's going to be the best for those two colors. Okay. okay. And I think we're going to. So Dave, in a, a Dave this, this is John. I, I will make sure to do an email introduction uh, with you and Ray so you have uh, each other's contact information. All right, thank you. I appreciate that. And yeah. just so you Sorry. know, we're probably going to have a meeting in a couple weeks talking about this specific thing, and we'll have more information for you then. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, Dave. Okay, another question here, uh, Ray. We don't always know who will attend a Harmony audit. Is it better to maintain standard viewing positions uh, or try and adjust based on people's heights and time of year? So in the presentation, I don't know if I said this, but between a short person and a tall person, the angle of incidence changes about by 15 degrees. So. I think, you know, if someone's like totally calling something completely different than what you're calling, then you need to figure out if it's the height thing, right? Um, but the distances definitely needs to be very specific because if someone's really close and someone's really far, I mean, I know like sometimes everyone kind of circles like a half moon around the vehicle and then everyone's looking at different angles. So that's not really being very uniform with how you're viewing the vehicle. So the distance is very important. Okay, thank you. Uh, another uh, question in here from Tim. Uh, how much of a geographical difference would there be, uh, would there need to be uh, to have a difference in visual color? Um, would you expect a visible color difference in Minnesota versus Texas, for example? I would say I yes. Reset. I would say there's definitely a potential. We would have to do some more research to figure out what the difference is, but I would think that's far enough away where you would see a difference or a potential difference. Okay. Okay. Uh, Tim, you're unmuted. Did that uh, help and answer your question? Uh, yes, it did. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, another one in here, Ray. Um, how can I simulate an outdoor environment inside? And uh, will it matter that there's diffuse lighting and not direct sunlight? So the diffuse lighting conditions won't show you the sparkle, but you can set up like an overhead lighting system that simulates more what you're going to see outside. But the direct okay. illumination is going to be the problem. I think maybe Greg okay. might have a comment on this. Greg, okay. you there? Oh, there you go. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. Um, you know, if you set up a harmony room, then you can simulate what the color travel is going to look like. Um, but you're going to lose that degree of sparkle influence. There are several devices on the market, handheld, um, basically high-powered flashlights that you could use in conjunction with um, a harmony room. If, if you think that sparkle is not being integrated into what you see visually. So they're commonly used in the refinish industry to quickly view uh, how somebody is painting a vehicle. And uh, 
they're they're really good tools and they're they're not very expensive. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, another. Um, wait, wait, oh, one more. Ahead, you just have to make sure when you're looking at the data from the Big Mac that you remember that the 45 and 75 angles or 25, 45, and 75 angles for sparkle are not the same angles as for color. So you'd want to make sure you're looking at it the same way with the leg then. Okay, good, good. Um, another question in here, um, can surface temperature cause the colors to measure differently? It depends on what the color is and what's in there. If you're in like Texas Bay and it's very, very hot out and you have like a red and the red changes with temperature, you could have a problem measuring or viewing okay. even if the two materials aren't the same. Okay, good. Um, Another one in here, too, and if anyone has any questions, please enter them in the Q&A box and we'll get to them. We have a lot of experts on the phone here. Um, even if you're experiencing some challenges at your own facilities, uh, we're here to help. Um, so just enter that in the Q&A box. Uh, but the next question I have here, uh, does lighting conditions change the way you see the color outside uh, versus instrumentation like a Big Mac? I don't know if I understand that question. Does the lighting condition change the way you see color outside versus using a Big Mac? Geraldine, mm -hmm. maybe you can jump in. I think you got this from one of your clients. There she is. Hi, yes, I'm talking about like um, from morning till noon versus um, the Big Mac, Horizon Lighting so, versus D65. So in the Big Mac, if you pick D65, you know, that should be around that 10 and 2 position. If you're looking at it after that time or say like, you know, 6 o'clock-ish where it starts to get redder, then that's actually Horizon Lighting and that would be different. So it would change the way you see it versus how the Big Mac reads, just based on the fact that we usually set the Big Mac up for D65 and not for a horizon or another illuminate. Great. Great, So Thank just you. Um, a further right. comment on that, John, is yeah, the, the data has been measured independent of the lighting condition. So you can get the data as if viewed in daylight or as in, if viewed in horizon. So if you think you have something that's metameric or something that's changing based on the lighting condition, you can calculate, you can get all those calculations and pair them numerically to see if it matches what you see visually. Can I make a comment on that though? Um, if you wanna change the illumination, the only way you can do that is in Smart Lab, not in Smart Process. Okay. Um, another question here, too, from uh, Marcus. Uh, when would you use a sphere geometry versus a 45-0 instrument for color measurement? So I would when I'm doing like harmony on the inside of the vehicle, I would always use a 45-0 because that measures more closely to what you see. But if you're doing like weathering testing or like material testing, um, then the sphere is the one you want to use because it basically tells you that the formulation is the same between the materials. But the 45-0 would be more what you would see for like color harmony. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. Looks like let me check the chat here. I think we're good uh, right now. But if anyone has um, questions, uh, please enter them in the Q and A box. Um, is there? And then just just to 
kind of continue the discussion, Ray, is there a best practices of when you should use, you know, visual uh, and instrumentation or how should those correlate um, together? So I would always do visual first because sometimes people get influenced by the data. And then once you do the visual assessment, you should look at the data and then see what angles it's actually correlating to. And then make sure that you don't have any angles that are completely out of spec, that you're just not picking up visually at the moment, and that you're going to have a problem with later down the line under different um, time or viewing condition. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, is anyone from our field team, are there um, questions you frequently get when it comes to visual versus uh, instrumentation um, or any of these sort of topics we're discussing today? While you're thinking of that, we just got a question in from Craig. How much does temperature affect color values? So the temperature, the Big Mac can measure a lot of different temperature ranges and it's stable. The only problem is if you have um, colors that actually change, the hotter they get. So most colors, like silvers or something like that, would be fine. But like a red maybe or an orange might change if it gets hotter. And that's when that's going to change the values in the instrument. But it's because the color is actually changing, not because the instrument is measuring too hot. Okay. And Craig, did that looking for you to unmute you here? Craig, did that answer your question, sir? Yes, it did. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. Let's see here. Um Anyone from our field team, are, are there frequent questions uh, you get? I mean, I can tell you what people usually say to me is that the instrument doesn't match what I see. And that's kind of why we did this, so that we could explain, mm -hmm. you know, different viewing conditions and how, like, the Big Mac, you know, like I saw, showed you those two times in Munich when it actually matches up the visual to the instrument, like what you're actually viewing. Um, so mm -hmm. it's just important to me for everyone to be aware that they know where the sun is and what angle they're actually looking at. And not just to look at that one angle mm -hmm. when you say, okay, I approve this color or this looks good. So you're looking at all the angles to make sure that one of those angles isn't actually out of spec and you're just missing it because of those lighting conditions. Ray, can you talk about the direction the Big Mac is measuring um, and which position you're placing it on the vehicle in different check zones? So for vertical surfaces, it's really important that if you take the cap off the Big Mac, there's an arrow that points down. And so you want that always pointing at the ground. And there's also two green LEDs. Um, that should be at the top, and you want the instrument in that position when you measure on a vehicle, because that correlates as closely as possible to what you see visually when you're looking at it outside. And then there's two different ways that people do horizontals. Some people have the LEDs, the green LEDs, towards the glass, that's on a hood or a trunk, or they have it where they go the same direction on both. So it depends on the OEM, how they measure, but the vertical surfaces are always the same. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got a question in here from William. What is the best practice to match color for wood stain, visually and instrumentally? I can so, field that one, John. Great, thanks, Greg. 
Um, so there's there's two parts to that. Um, visually, you want to make sure you have a, a standard viewing distance so that the any influence in grain um, can be taken into account or you see basically that resolution the same. Um, usually you're viewing these types of products in a light booth. So sometimes people put them in the back of the light booth or at a 45 degree angle and then stand at the front of the light booth and view them that way. Um, you can do color measurement on wood stains. It's just depending upon the, the wood grain itself, you're gonna have to do a lot of averaging. If you're, if you're well, looking at certain, certain color match situations, People will always measure in the cathedral part of the um, wood grain, which is usually the, the lighter part surrounded by the darker part. And they try to color match for that lighter version because the, the grain is just an enhancement of that lighter version. And then for QC of wood stains, you can do a, a transmission measurement on that, like with a liquid color instrument. You just have to reduce, reduce down the stain and use a very thin path length cell to get good repeatable results. Does that help? Okay, thank you, Greg. William, I'm gonna unmute you here. Um, did that help you? Yes, it helps. Uh, I have a, 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 a more, uh, one more question. You know, I know some people actually they they mix the the wood stain, then they do a drawdown on the on the drawdown chart, which you know still see a lot of white, and then they measure the color in delta E. Does that help or? Yes, yeah. that, that's uh, that's a valid that's a valid test. A lot of people do that. Um, you might want to look at using both a coded and uncoded chart, so you get on the uncoded. Part of the chart, you get some absorption into the paper, um, and then you just have to see how consistent that process is with the the material that you're using. Okay, and thank you very much. Prob probably, probably use a wire wound bar um, that can disperse a thinner coating, and it might be easier to control. Okay. Okay. Good. Great. Uh, next question here from Marcus. Uh, do, you re do you recommend specification by LAB individually, um, L separate, A separate, B separate, individually, or by delta E? Can you unmute him? Yeah. Marcus, I'm gonna unmute yep. you here. Uh, would you mind elaborating a little? Sure. Um, we have, uh, we have different plants and maybe some different methods we use to spec and then certain customers have different needs and, and some like to spec the L component, A component and B component separately rather than a whole delta E. Um, I think the perception is, I, I typically it's like, some of them like like half a unit on A and B and, a, and one unit on L for, I think of the delta E would be like 1.22. Um, is there a preference or? So are you only using C-Lab? Uh, yeah, yeah. So if you only pass fail on the Delta E, the problem you can get into is one of those components can be out and the yeah. other can be fairly close in and so your color match can be bad, even though you're yeah. passing that Delta E. So I would say do the L, A, and the B I think that's a better way if you're trying to match what you see visually. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, Ray. Um, what other questions do people have? Um, enter them in the, the Q&A box. Um, like I said, we have a lot of experts on the phone here um, from a you know, variety of backgrounds and industries. Um, we'd love to help in any way we can. Or are you experiencing a specific challenge in your own facility? Um, let us know how we can help here. This is, you know, your time. That's what we use this office hours format for to really 
um, get into an open Q&A session and uh, do what we can to help. So I can tell you one thing that we hear a lot or and we also see a lot is um, when the fascias are at a slightly different angle when they match up to the body. And so visually, it can look pretty bad because you're actually looking at two different angles. And that's like a big challenge in the industry. So a lot of the OEMs are trying to make sure that that fascia to body matchup is flat. But a lot of the car designs like right now still have like slight variation in that angle. So that makes it look off color even though technically the paint's matching. So that's just something to be aware of if you have that happening to you when you're at an automotive plant. Definitely something to keep in mind. Thank you. Ray, what else does anybody have here? Any no, from our sales the, or applications? Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, the one other thing that we haven't talked about um, is that if if somebody is placking a part or placking a body, uh, just keep in mind that the standards that are distributed are not, they, they might be close to the digital standard, but they're not the exact standard. So if it's a display standard, and it could be that those are circulated for, you know, quick visual judgments, um, it, it is different than the digital standard. So you might want to measure those, any of those working standards that you have, just to understand how they are related to the digital standard. That's a great point. So one thing to clarify too, the standards that you guys usually get are working standards, and the display standard that he's talking about is just basically to make sure the color is the color. The working standard should be fairly close to the digital. Good. Okay, other questions here? Nothing else logged into the chat or Q&A at the moment, but we're here to help. Anyone from our field team or, or quarry applications, um, any comments on any of the material discussed or any elaborations? You know, another question too, um, if anybody has, you know, how, how can Vic Gardner help and assist in your um, color programs. Yeah, we've done a lot of work with like the OEMs to help them set up color programs that make sense. I mean, the thing that we're most interested in is that the vehicle looks good. So we don't want to mm -hmm. set up content that makes no sense or something like that. We want to make sure that when you measure it, it looks like what you see on the vehicle, and we want the visual to correlate to the instrument. So this is really important to us as a company. So if you're having any problems with what you're measuring is not matching what you see visually, just definitely contact us, and we can come in and help you. So that's important for us to make sure that that's happy. Yep. Uh, another note here, question in here from Tim. Is there much difference between a smooth surface versus a pebble surface on the same color? Which color has the most effect, um, L, A, or B? You're gonna have to unmute him. Wait, yeah. Tim, you are now unmuted here. Do you mind elaborating a little bit? Sure, so if giving the same color uh, on the two different surfaces, right? Apple versus smooth, is that much different um, when an instrument measures the color on two different surfaces? Can I ask what you mean by pebble surface? Pebble is embossed, not smooth. Okay. 
So I'm still not sure what. Is that, is that embossed, did you say, Tim? Right. Embossed. So. And smooth plus a smooth uh, surface. A smooth surface versus like a textured surface? Right. Okay. So, yes, the color is definitely affected by that. Um, it depends on what type of texture you have. So, the smooth surface could be maybe darker and the other surface because it's textured might reflect the light differently. So, you might see it maybe lighter. Um, but it all depends on the color and what the texture is. But there's definitely a difference. So if you have a color with multiple textures, you want to measure each one of those textures as a standard and then measure that texture against that standard, not against the flat standard. Make sense? Yes. So the, the dark and light uh, would have the most effect on each of those two surfaces, right? Sorry, I missed that. I'd say so, so the black, dark, dark and light would have the most effect on the two surfaces. Delta A and Delta B wouldn't be affected as much as the uh, Delta L. Yeah, I mean, most of the time, I would say yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, another question here uh, from Brian. How does gloss affect color strength measurements? Greg, this is a you question. <laughs> so gloss, um, gloss changes will definitely affect color strength. Um, depends on the the color, obviously, um, but it's it's important to control both color and gloss when you're doing strength color strength testing. Essentially, the, if you increase in gloss, your your color is going to look darker and more chromatic, and it'll it'll appear stronger or a higher color strength. Brian, did that answer your question here? And it looks like he, let's see. Looks like he dropped off. So hopefully he'll be back with us. Hopefully that answered the question. Uh, Frederick, uh, he asked, do you have any, uh, or I'm sorry, do any of the OEMs use a combination of an instrument and visual when evaluating color harmony? Yes. Now, almost every um, OEM right now does instrumental and visual. But like I said before, um, the visual is basically their go-no-go, -go, and then they use the instruments to kind of quantify what they're seeing and make sure that that stays stable over time. So the instrument portion is really important. Um, it also helps them get the initial um, color matches maybe a little bit closer to the digital standard. So when they go to launch those vehicles, the harmony is better. So since everyone's going to a single target, instead of going to whatever the panel they have or whatever target they think they should have, everyone's going to the same place. And it's really important for them because it saves them time in launching new colors or even new vehicles. So we have an OEM we're working with right now that they've done um, a lot of work with what we call data share. Um, they're actually eliminating maybe 20 trials of vehicles online with this new data share because they're actually knowing where those add-on parts are going to come in before they get to the door so they can make adjustments before they even build the first, first vehicle. So that's really exciting. Definitely. Uh, Frederick, I'm going to unmute you. Um, welcome and did that answer your question, sir? Uh, yes, I was thinking more as instead of like a launching scenario, just as when they have like the color audits at the assembly plants to review color harmony, when they go and 
walk around and look at the parts visually, it seems like at least the ones I've ever been in part of, they just kind of take down notes. But I was wondering, it seems like if they were to actually read the parts with a spectrometer, then they'd have, you know, uh, more objective color position and they could pass that information along to the suppliers. I totally agree with you. I think sometimes what they do is they actually read the vehicles before you guys look at them, so you actually don't see them measure them. But we get a lot of, lot of Harmony data from all the OEMs, so it may just be that they're doing it when you're not there. Oh, okay. And it, it's one specific plant or something, but yeah, usually they have that, that Harmony vehicle. Now, is, is that something that they usually make available to anybody? No, it depends on the OEM. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you can. Doesn't hurt if you want, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you could always, if you want to, me after, or I can email you. Um, I can tell you, you can ask a specific OEM and I can tell you what they're doing. It's like, okay. I can connect you both over, over email, including this. Good. Thank you, Frederick. Thank you. Okay. Other questions or comments? Uh, we have a little bit of time left here. How can we help? A lot of experts on the phone here. Um, uh, something you said earlier, Ray, too, about uh, color programs. And, and just a note to everyone, we do record all of our, our seminars, uh, web seminars, and uh, office hours. Um, so we do have recordings of those. If you'd like to um, see you know, a list of them, if you'd like to uh, listen to a, a particular topic, again, or maybe you missed it first go around, uh, please let uh, your regional sales manager, inside sales manager, or you know any of us know, and we can uh, get you a link and, and password to that recording. So other questions um, or comments um, from anyone uh, on the phone in the audience, anyone from our, our field or applications team? Any specific challenges you're facing that we, we can assist with, um, either publicly here or, or we can connect you um, directly with, with Ray or, or the appropriate person inside BIC? I have one other comment. So, I mean, I think we have some add-on card suppliers. <clears throat> um, what I would tell you is the best way if you want to correlate your data to the data that's actually being measured for the color harmony is to measure in car position with the LEDs, those green LEDs at the top, as I said, because that's the best way that data is going to correlate to what they measure and plus what they're going to see visually on the vehicle. I know some parts you cannot measure that way, and we understand that, but if you can, try to measure in car position. Okay. Excellent. We'll just give it another bit here to see if anyone has any, any further questions. Um, no, we, we will be continuing this through the end of the year, um, not at the uh, pace that we have been. Um, there may be an office hours uh, every three weeks, every four weeks, um, just depending on, on the schedule here. Um, still looking at a variety of topics and also um, it's definitely part of our planning for uh, 2021. Uh, we've had great response and great attendance and feel that this is valuable, um, you know, and just want to help our customers uh, in any way we can. So with that, Ray, um, I don't see any other questions, so I think we'll call it a wrap. Um, thank you, Ray, uh, Greg, 
you know, the team here at VIC uh, for your information. Thank you everyone for attending and your questions and comments. And we look forward to seeing you on future uh, web seminars uh, from Vic Gardner. And uh, as always, if at any time we can assist in any way, reach out to any one of us and uh, uh, we'll do what we can to help you. So have a great rest of your day and uh, thank you. Thank you.